Good morning, and thank you for joining today's event on the functioning of democracy across the urban rural spectrum. I'm Sarah Mills, and I'm a project manager at CLOSEUP, the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy, which is one of the research centers here at the Ford School. Before getting too far in, I want to first thank CLOSEUP for funding the research projects that will be presented today, and also to thank Bonnie, Bonnie Roberts and Miriam Nagarin for all of their help in pulling together today's event. I also want to note that this is being hosted as part of the Ford School's Conversations Across Difference initiative and that the session is being recorded and that the recording and the um, slides from today's session will be available on CLOSEUP's website later on uh, this week. And we'll also post the final student research papers later this semester once they've crossed all of their T's and dotted their I's. So, the idea behind this session is actually a couple of years in the making. Uh, when I joined Close Up in 2015 to help manage the Michigan Public Policy Survey, I was struck by how much data we had from local officials across the urban rural spectrum. For those of you who might not know about it, the MPPS is a census survey of all 1,856 local governments in Michigan. Um, it's sent to the top elected and appointed official in each of these jurisdictions. So the city mayor and township supervisor, the county commission, uh, the county administrator or uh, village manager. It's been going on since 2009. And in that time, it has covered pretty much any topic you can imagine about the functioning of local government or issues that impact local communities. The MPPS uh, prides itself on hearing from over 70% of local governments in the state on each of its waves and, we're, and is truly committed to transparency. All of the survey questions from the survey are online. Um, there's pre-made data tables broken down by region of the state, uh, population size, jurisdiction type. And there's also anonymized data sets that are available for you to use. And these are shared through ICPSR. But what I think is truly remarkable is that this data allows for some amazing insights into issues across the urban rural continuum. Most surveys are sent um, based, uh, are based on individual responses. And so survey respondents tend to be only about 20% of the sample, um, given that they are 20% of the population. But because the MPPS um, in the MPPS, every unit of government is contacted and counts as one response, whether you are the tiniest township in the Upper Peninsula or you are the city of Detroit. We have an amazing amount of data coming from rural areas to allow for a large enough sample size to actually compare urban and rural places. For the analysis that the students are using today, we base it on US census classification of census tracts within a jurisdiction. So, uh, from jurisdictions that have only rural census tracts or only urban or urban cluster census tracts to those in the middle. And those kind of mostly rural and mostly urban classifications are based on the percentage of um, the jurisdiction's population that's in a rural or urban or urban cluster census tract. I should just note that there are a bunch of different ways to measure rurality, but we found that this one is the it closest represents how survey respondents, the local officials that the census, the census survey is sent to, think about their own place. Today's lineup um, includes five master's students who are all using this four-way measure of rurality with existing data from the MPPS. The topics that they'll be covering have some connection uh, to the functioning of democracy, mostly at the very local level. And you can see here that they pull from a variety of past MPPS data sets. Before handing the floor over to them, I wanna make sure and make the pitch um, that there are many more papers about urban and rural similarities and differences that can be written from the MPPS data. And so you can learn more about accessing the data through this link that I've shared here and that uh, once I'm done speaking, I can share out in the chat um, or by contacting us through this email address. In terms of format for the session, 
we're going to have all five of the speakers go in sequence, and then um, I'll moderate the question and answer session at the end. So feel free to post questions in the Q&A function, or um, that's the easiest way for us to find them, but you can also use the chat um, along the way. Uh, and so do post them as those questions come to you. And then now without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to the first speaker who is Kyron Smith. Kyron, if you wanna start sharing your screen while I introduce you. Um, he is a first year master of public policy candidate at the Ford School. And he's going to share um, about local officials perceptions of civic discourse. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kyron Smith, and as Sarah mentioned, I am a first year Master of Public Policy student at the Ford School. Today, I'll be presenting on my project entitled Elected Officials Perceptions of Civic Discourse with and among residents across the urban rural spectrum. To begin, I want to go over my methods as they are key to understanding this research and some of the slides that follow. The research in this presentation were taken from the spring 2018 MPPS survey, and these questions revolved around civic discourse across the state of Michigan in different jurisdictions. Now, another thing I want to note, because this is based off of the urban and rural spectrum, I want to talk about how I determine uh, urban and rural jurisdictions, as my, uh, my method of getting these are a little different than some of the presentations that you'll see later on. For my survey in spring 2018, the question was actually asked to elected officials how they characterize their jurisdictions. And in that, it yielded these variables to determine the rurality and urbanity of the different jurisdictions, where we have rural, mostly rural, mostly urban, urban, and don't know. These survey responses were cross-tabulated and, anal and analyzed with the different questions about civic discourse in this presentation. The first question we'll go over is civic discourse between elected officials and residents. As you can see, and what I would like to point out, is that along the rural to urban spectrum, we see a trend where the plurality of respondents all agree that civic discourse between elected officials and residents is somewhat constructive, where we see in the rural jurisdictions, 38.8% of respondents said it was somewhat constructive and mostly rural 40.8 and mostly urban 42.2 and an urban 43%. What is important about this finding is that in a time where we see a lot of divisiveness and a lot of differences between the urban rural spectrum, we see off of this first question that there is agreement about civil discourse and the overall understanding that elected officials generally believe that civic discourse in this sense is somewhat constructive. Next, we move to our next question, which is civic discourse among residents. Now, keep in mind, this survey was given to elected officials and their responses are based off of how they perceive this discourse is among residents. So when we look at this trend, we see something similar, which is where urban through rural, we see a trend that everyone agrees pretty much on the plural result. Where we see in rural municipalities, 39.6% of respondents believe that civic discourse among residents was a mix of both constructive and divisive, mostly urban, or I'm sorry, mostly rural 35.9%, mostly urban 48.1%, and urban 44.8%. What I also thought was worth noting is the second highest response, where we see that most of these jurisdictions have respondents who say uh, that the second highest response is somewhat constructive. This kind of leans to the thought that elected officials generally think positively about the civic discourse in their jurisdictions. We see that, you know, the main response in this question was mixed and the first one was somewhat constructive and here the second highest response is somewhat constructive. And even looking at the number of divisive responses is very low across these two questions. Now let's look at how this has changed in the last five years and what civic discourse looks like through the tone of discussion. 
Keep in mind, this survey was done in 2018. So we're talking about the range of time between 2013 uh, to about 2018. When we look at this, we see between elected officials and residents, also the trend continues, where across the urban and rural spectrum, the highest response was that civic, that civil discussion. So the tone in civil discussion was neither more nor less civil. When we talk about among residents, we see something similar. What I also felt was worth noting, again, when talking about elected officials and residents, is that second highest response. So we see that across the rural and urban spectrum, all of them agree kind of that the second highest response is, is uh, consistent across the urban and rural spectrum, which was somewhat more civil. What's different and interesting, however, is when we look at among residents, so discourse that excludes the elected official. We see in rural, rural settings that it's generally positive. So the second answer, the second most common answer was somewhat more civil. However, when we go to the more urban uh, parts, we see that the second highest response was somewhat less civil, kind of leading to a less positive thought of elected officials in urban versus rural. But please remember the overall finding is that they tend to agree um, in the trend that neither more nor less um, civil um, the conversation has become. So keep in mind the question or just think about the question, how do elected officials think of discourse when they are not involved? What we see is that elected officials feel civil discourse is more positive when they're involved versus when they're not. Drawing back to some of the questions, when we looked at the state of discourse between elected officials and residents, 66% of the respondents thought that discourse was constructive. When we look among residents, they found that 38% of discourse between residents was constructive, which was a 28 point difference. When we went to the five year, question, we saw that elected officials and residents among their conversations was 34% constructive. And when we removed the elected officials and just looked at discourse among residents, it was 23% um, percent constructive, 11 points lower. What this kind of yields is to the thought that elected officials believe that when they are involved, that civic discourse um, is more positive. Now, why does any of this matter? As I mentioned earlier, we live in a time and a day where people are particularly divisive, especially across urban and rural spectrums, where they think elected officials think fundamentally different. This research points to otherwise, as elected officials along the urban and rural spectrum have shown in, this, in these questions to think similarly about civil, civic discourse. Knowing this can change the perception about how elected officials feel about civic discourse. It can change the perception that the way they feel does not depend on their urbanity or rurality. And moving forward, this allows research to better assess more pertinent factors and why civic discourse across jurisdictions is the way that it is, since it's likely is not due to whether they are urban and rural or rural jurisdictions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kyron. Um, next up is Carly Thurston. She is a first year Master of Public Policy candidate at the Ford School as well. Um, and she's going to be talking about local officials perspective perspectives on public participation. And again, if you have any questions for Kyron or Carly or any of the other speakers, please, um, you can type them into the Q&A and we'll collate them for later on. All right. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Well, good morning, everyone. So let's launch right in. Uh, let's take a look at how civic participation in their local decision making uh, varies or doesn't across the urban and rural spectrum. Um, so first off, uh, measuring particip public participation can be a little bit tricky. Uh, a lot of things go into the level of uh, sort of civic participation, um, as well as that determine the most effective means for getting um, citizens to help with decision making. Uh, the sort of most clear and, and best studied of these are individual level factors such as education, age, income, other demographic factors. Um, but there's also a lot of societal factors that are a little bit harder to grasp. Um, that can mean whether the government is structured uh, in a decentralized enough way to allow for citizen participation, uh, the level of public interest, perceived roles of citizens with their government, and sort of semi-individual factors like social networks. Uh, the way that the urban and rural spectrum plays into this hasn't really been particularly well studied, um, certainly not in the US. Um, there are sort of mixed results from international literature. Uh, so a Thai study reported greater urban engagement, 
um, there have been pretty successful rural development measures in um, kind of across uh, India, Europe, Australia. Um, and so we're kind of curious how those might play out uh, here in Michigan. So in order to detangle the uh, urban and rural effects, we kind of need to control for some of those other factors. Um, so Christian is going to get uh, very much in depth on citizen engagement here in a minute, um, but just to kind of provide us a benchmark, uh, I've got an aggregate for you here. Um, so the bolded numbers are the ones that scored the best, so to speak, in each category. Um, and so measured here are citizen interest, uh, is government decision-making transparent, uh, do citizens want to be involved, that sort of thing. Uh, this disinterest score is um, like whether officials report having trouble finding people to serve on committees. Um, and then we've got the percentage of officials that are saying citizens should have the final say on controversial decisions, and they can usually be trusted um, to be responsible participants. Um, and there are variations between these categories in aggregate. They're, they're much stronger for each sort of um, individual factor. Um, but overall, there's not really a clear pattern. So we can kind of, um, as we're measuring availability and effectiveness of participation, uh, we can kind of account for interest being similar. Um, so uh, the MPPS asks officials if they foster participation through uh, 20 different sort of mechanisms. Um, and I looked at these both individually and all together, as well as sort of in subgroups for uh, one-way information sharing, uh, sort of two-way limited meeting and communication and sort of more ongoing formal uh, participation uh, actions category. Um, and these were all yes or no questions for availability. So they were aggregated and, and averaged across each type of jurisdiction to find the sort of percent of opportunities that each uh, official makes available. So the responses here are not nearly so ambiguous as the interest level um, measurements. Uh, so the orange section here is uh, completely rural jurisdictions. Um, dark blue is completely urban. Um, that color scheme is going to stick around. Um, and, and we can see that urban uh, jurisdictions far and away are offering more means of public participation. Uh, what we're not seeing, however, is that they're being uh, rating these methods as more effective. So for each yes response, um, officials were then asked to rate the effectiveness um, of those measures. Um, so here in the table to your left, again, the bolded numbers have the, the highest scores um, for on a scale of one to five. Um, urban jurisdictions uh, rated the highest overall um, in terms of effectiveness and in two of the three subcategories. But as you can see from the table, these were really minimal differences and they were not statistically significant, um, at least at any of the aggregated levels. A couple of the methods um, individually saw some major variation. Um, below here, you can kind of see the aggregate effectiveness of all measures. Um, and you can see that the distribution tracks really closely for each uh, kind of area. The, the black bar here is the total. Um, in general, we're seeing pretty, pretty warm feelings about the effectiveness of public participation. Um, so taking a little bit closer at these sub, look at these subgroups for availability, uh, we saw that these findings uh, were consistent across each group. Um, so you've got the uh, completely urban areas are seeing the most information mechanisms, the most meeting mechanisms, and the most um, sort of active participation methods. Um, and that remains consistent um, when these features were regressed on things like education, population, poverty rate, even interest, um, some of those other variables that were prominent in the literature, uh, we still saw the most availability from urban areas, um, but still pretty mixed effectiveness ratings. Um, participatory budget adoption is uh, kind of a specific case study of public participation um, and while this is primarily a rural initiative worldwide, um, here we still got that urban areas are using the most sort of uh, methods to involve citizens in their budget setting, um, though they also have the highest percentage of saying that they did not use any. So uh, that means urban areas that did um, involve citizens in their budget making used a lot of methods, but rural areas were slightly more likely to do at least one. Um, so to wrap things up, uh, Across the urban and rural spectrum, 
um, citizen and official interest in, in being involved is uh, pretty consistent. And the effectiveness of um, public participation is pretty similar, but urban areas are offering a lot more formal avenues to participation. Uh, this implies a few things. We might not be fully capturing uh, the way that rural um, officials are engaging their citizens. It can also just mean that urban officials are well aware that um, with kind of a larger population, uh, they need a little bit broader of a strategy to get citizens involved. Um, and this is important because uh, kind of knowing, knowing these things and knowing how to best encourage um, civic engagement uh, allows for flexible and effective policy at the local level, um, which leads to better economic outcomes, uh, better community inclusion, um, and can also kind of help account for uh, more fragmented national policy. And that is all I've got for you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carly. Um, Christian Hunter is up next. Christian is a second year Master of Urban and Regional Planning student. And he's gonna, as Carly mentioned, carry on this theme of, about talking about public participation, looking specifically at local officials' perceptions of citizen engagement. And again, folks that are uh, listening to the webinar, if you have any questions for um, any of the panelists, feel free to post them in Q&A or the chat function and we'll, uh, we're running on track. So we'll have plenty of time to answer those at the end. Go ahead, Christian. Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I just wanna talk, um, as Sarah said, I just wanna um, carry on the conversation looking at, um, citizen engagement across the rural urban spectrum. Um, to start, I'd actually like to define what citizen engagement is. Um, I actually found this very helpful definition from the APA that says that individual and collective actions designed to identify and address issues of public concern. Um, and I wanted to lay out some examples as well. Um, so surveys are often used as well as open houses and brainstorming sessions. And then um, as Carly touched on in her presentation, also participatory budget meetings um, can be an example of citizen engagement. Um, and as the theme generally states, I wanted to see um, how perceptions of citizen engagement differ across uh, urban and rural areas, um, as well as some of the different implementations that might arise. So some of the methods that I used, um, I analyzed data from the Michigan Public Policy Survey from fall 2012 um, using weighted cross tabulation. Um, and for my specific questions, um, I chose questions looking at sort of three main buckets or themes um, that we'll touch on uh, throughout this presentation. The first is uh, the current state of citizen engagement, um, some of the qualities there and how they might differ across the rural and urban spectrum. Um, approaches to citizen engagement, how this differs between urban and rural areas. Um, and then uh, looking at different jurisdictions' opinions on what citizen engagement is for, and again, whether this is different or similar. Um, to start with the current state of citizen engagement, um, I'm going to just write, jump right in. Uh, forewarning, I have a lot of charts, <laughs> so bear with me. Um, one of the first things that I found is that um, opportunities for citizen engagement generally aren't being taken. Um, there was actually a previous question on the survey before this one asked about jurisdictions, whether they provide everyone to have a voice in the community. And overwhelmingly, 80% of jurisdictions across the rural and urban spectrum said yes. Um, however, when it came to opportunities, um, whether agreeing whether opportunities aren't being taken, um, unfortunately, again, across the urban and rural spectrum, um, there's strong agreement that this was the case that citizens weren't necessarily taking advantage of all these opportunities that were being provided um, to voice their opinions. Um, this can be seen um, in an additional dimension as well. Um, in who's showing up? Um, I know that a lot of us, uh, perhaps, <laughs> when we think about citizen engagement, we think of um, town hall meetings where you know the people that have the most active voice show up over and over again. Um, and the data is sort of bearing this out again, across the urban and rural spectrum, which is very interesting, that there was actually very little variation in this answer. Um, most jurisdictions strongly or somewhat agreed um, that their efforts tended to attract the same people over and over. Um, 
both of these responses are interesting because they can inform, um, first of all, it shows that it's a common issue and it's not necessarily relegated to whether the area is rural or urban um, and potentially offers opportunities um, to look at effective policies that can sort of help with that across both types of jurisdictions. Um, for the second category, um, looking at approaches to citizen engagement. Um, so one of the common uh, things that arose um, was this idea of formal engagement versus informal engagement um, and how communities perceive this differently. So communities in the across the urban and rural spectrum were actually asked um, uh, whether they agree with the statement that they don't need formal engagement efforts because our local officials already know what the citizens want. So actually, um, most like completely and mostly urban areas actually very much disagreed saying that um, we would like to pursue more formal engagement efforts. Um, however, this actually for mostly rural and completely rural areas, this was a little bit perhaps more um, not necessarily a pro, but more of an ambivalence towards this, saying that, you know, we, we may or may not agree with a statement necessarily. Um, but it's important to note that despite this formal informal, that um, engagement is still happening in these communities. It's just a matter of the form that it takes. Um, and one of these questions uh, touches on this a little bit. Um, this one is particularly interesting looking at um, whether jurisdictions agree that some of the best engagement with citizens happens informally around the community. Um, overwhelmingly, uh, jurisdictions across the or rural and urban spectrum agreed. Um, I, I sort of expected going into this that um, the mostly rural and completely rural areas would have a high level of agreement, um, given that they are tend to more be more reliant um, on informal engagement as per the earlier question. However, what is heartening to see um, is that completely and mostly urban areas also agree with this. Um, uh, and this sort of set of questions is uh, important for the larger discussion of this section, um, seeing how um, perhaps like local communities um, in mostly rural and completely rural areas um, tend to use more informal methods, but perhaps in completely urban and mostly urban areas, um, they are using a combination of both informal and formal approaches. Um, the last the last set of questions I'm going to just quickly dive into is looking at um, what citizen what is citizen engagement and how this view is different or similar across the rural and urban spectrum. Um, so what is interest so for this set I looked at both um, how the jurisdiction council and boards of these communities so sort of think of <laughs> as the people in charge, how they view citizen engagement um, and then comparing that with how employees of these jurisdictions view citizen engagement. Um, so to start uh, across the rural and urban spectrum, the majority of the jurisdiction councils and boards um, believe that citizen engagement mainly exists to have citizens provide input. Um, a much smaller percentage, closer to about 20% across um, the rural and urban spectrum think it's more for keeping citizens informed. Um, however, this is notable again, because um, there's a lack of uh, difference here, um, which suggests that um, even in very different potentially like demographic or uh, spatial makeups that um, these councils and boards feel very similarly. Um, this did break down, however, when we looked at jurisdictional employees. Um, so for mostly rural and completely rural areas, um, this trend continued to hold so that most um, most completely rural and mostly rural employees actually thought that um, the main point was to provide input for, um, for having citizens provide input. However, um, in urban areas, there's a much higher percentage that thought it was mainly to keep citizens informed. Um, not only is this difference interesting um, in potentially looking at uh, different policy interventions and different um, citizen engagement strategies across um, rural and urban areas, um, but it also sheds light on um, potential disconnects between um, the higher up council board members and then um, the employees that actually go about implementing citizen engagement. Um, and last but not least, I just want to leave you all with this question. Um, 
are we satisfied? So jurisdictions across the rural urban spectrum were asked this question. And generally, um, you know, despite some of the issues such as people, same people showing up over and over and, um, you know, citizens not taking advantage, um, generally they are satisfied. Um, I would say so somewhat satisfied is the most common category, um, which potentially leaves room for improvement, but um, that it is functioning as is. All right, that's the end of my presentation. Um, and I wanna turn it back over to Sarah. Great, thank you, Christian. Um, Julie Rubin is up next, and um, she is a second year Master of Public Policy candidate at the Ford School. Um, and she is going to talk about internet connectivity and access to information across the spectrum. And again, I, we have seen some questions come in, some uh, one through the Q&A, but a couple also in chats to the panelists. So we're collecting them and we'll uh, turn to them after Julie and Christina go. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so hello, my name's Julie Rubin and today I'll be talking about internet access and connectivity across the urban rural spectrum. And I think it's a really nice bridge between um, Christian and Carly's presentation on civic engagement. Um, so while access to broadband has expanded and might seem ubiquitous these days, uh, there does remain a digital divide between those who have access to internet and those who don't. And when this digital divide follow, falls along the urban rural spectrum, it can contribute to a rural penalty which is a collection of disadvantages that folks in rural areas might suffer due to being far from markets or not having access to internet and goods. And you can especially think of that um, today when we're all um, so reliant on our internet that not having that uh, solid access can really build up. So access to broadband is generally correlated with an increased access to goods and government services. So one mitigating strategy for this rural penalty is to provide an official jurisdiction website that has information about government services and also government information. Uh, for this project, I looked at how urban and rural areas differ in their access to local government services via technology. And similar to Christian, I also used the fall 2012 MPPS data. I looked at questions related to jurisdictions use of technology to engage their citizens as well as the services that are provided through a jurisdiction's website if they have one. And while I recognize that 2012 is pretty far off in terms of technology, um, I also found some information from this past year from Connected Nation on Michigan's broadband access. And while it doesn't direct, it's not directly analogous uh, because it talks more about broadband access and speed, there still remains a divide between urban and rural areas that I'm about to show you. So I think that it, it still holds up, although the effect size may be a bit smaller. So just to jump in, um, the first question I looked at was the extent that jurisdictions try to engage their citizens through technology. And the green bar at the top is the one to really pay attention to here. So urban areas engage citizens through technology more than rural areas. You can see that a completely rural area, um, about 30% of jurisdictions don't engage their citizens through technology at all compared with almost 100% for the completely urban areas. And you can imagine this has impacts on citizen engagement as well as public participation as well. Um, a similar trend is related to jurisdictions official websites. So urban areas are more likely to have an official website than rural areas. You can see, um, I think it's 99% of completely urban areas do have an official website. And that number drops down to a little bit below 60% for a completely rural area. And then, of course, we can look into what's offered on a website if a rural area has one. So I've broken this out into two areas, um, access to online government services and access to information. So we'll look at online government services first. And this is just one question that was asked on the survey, but I think it's pretty representative of the other questions, the same trend line um, ensues. So completely urban districts are more likely to offer online services such as taxes, paying fines, or working through permitting issues through their website. Um, and this is just for jurisdictions who have an official website. Well, completely rural districts, you can see that number is much lower, just a little bit more than 
Um, addition, in addition to these online government services, um, rural areas also have less access to online government information. Now, this is a pretty jarring example. Uh, the effect wasn't quite as large in the uh, questions related to posting meeting agendas and meeting minutes, but it's still pretty clear that rural areas, even those who do have a website, are um, a lot less likely to post online government information. And you can imagine that this has effect, um, implications for how people can uh, interact with their public officials, how they can get involved in meetings and decisions, and creates barriers if you have to travel a long distance to go to a government um, public forum or meeting or to go to an office to complete a service outside of working business hours. Additionally, there were also differences between urban and rural areas in regards to barriers to using technology. So you can imagine that rural areas who perhaps don't have access to high speed internet are a bit more at the beginning of the technology adoption process. So they, their issues are more related to lack of high speed internet and also lack of infrastructure. While an urban area that has already probably has a website um, and technology up and running is more concerned with issues related to compliance and privacy. So making sure that everything um, is aligned with state and local and federal laws. Although there are many differences, as we can see, um, urban and rural areas do report similar satisfaction levels with what's being offered online. So public officials generally believe at the same rates across the urban rural spectrum that what they're offering works for their citizens or doesn't work um, and that that they're doing um, a sufficient job at providing services and information. Um, so this leaves a few questions such as um, I think it'd be really interesting to see what this looks like today and how the rate of adoption of these different technologies differs across the urban and rural areas in the past eight years. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, and want to acknowledge that one of the questions that came in is about the, the timing of the data. And that's one of the things that Julie highlighted as well, um, that re repeating this is uh, maybe warranted. Um, last but not least is Christina Curtis. So while she is working on getting her screen shared, I will introduce her. She's a first year Master of Public Policy candidate at the Ford School. And as you can see, she's gonna tell us about uh, perceptions on privatization of local government services. Hi everyone, like Sarah said, my name is Christina Curtis and I am a first year Master's of Public Policy student at the Ford School. Over the past semester, I've spent my time researching what local privatization looks like across the urban and rural spectrum. So to begin, I think it's important to understand why this conversation is important. And that's because for decades, municipalities have taken on numerous tasks that the private sector would have otherwise performed. We saw this trend starting in the early 1900s in urban areas who were able to expand public services through things like public parks, public spaces and day to day services. And we saw that mount across the nation until about the 1980s with the rise of the Reagan administration and the ideology of don't just stand there, undo something. Because of this, we saw the trend of privating or creating contracted out services accelerate through the 90s and into what we see today. And today, experts estimate that about a trillion dollars of America's six trillion spending in annual federal, state, and local governments goes towards providing services for through private companies. While it may not be particularly clear on face privatization. Uh, and the ways that local governments prioritize it um, are equally about questions of why democracies function. Current day literature that talks about privatization is worried about um, how privatization is um, evaluated and there's a current push for a form of responsible contracting where we've seen currently 18 states and numerous municipalities have put forth laws to meet a responsible contracting standard. However, Michigan and our municipalities in Michigan are not one of these areas. Thus, we see these calls for transparency and accountability as a request for an increase in government oversight. Finally, I think it's important to analyze or understand that uh, the research about privatization across an urban rural spectrum uh, does not currently exist and it is important that we uh, use this data to understand what nuances in the literature look like. Because we know that experts agree that 
privatization is neither inherently good or inherently bad, but the goals that uh, local officials and municipalities use to increase a local government priority of privatization um, may craft a public narrative that forces people to believe otherwise. For example, a municipality may cite something like a budget shortfall or an economic shortfall in their region as a reason why contracting out services is important because a private service on the market um, provides a profit as opposed to something like party identification, which would be seen as a negative perception, especially in terms of Democrats who are more likely to come forward against privatization um, because of things like sympathy towards unions. At the end of the day, however, it's a private decision or a political decision that can be impacted by quite a few other factors. So similar to everyone else, I do Wow, I produced a weighted cross tabulation to understand um, how certain variables impact uh, privatization across the urban rural spectrum. The first question I asked was whether or not municipalities contract out services. And you can see based off of the results that the dark blue areas indicate yes, municipalities currently do contract services. We see obviously in every single area that there is contracting services. However, they're more likely to occur in urban and completely, mostly urban and completely urban areas. Um, after seeing the results, I was curious to understand how um, these results impact what we know based off of the literature. So holding all else constant, I wanted to determine if the location, municipality's location on the urban rural spectrum, the municipality's political party, or the risk of a municipality finding a budget shortfall would impact the relationship between whether or not a municipality determines that they want to contract out service. And while we see similar to how I mentioned that there's a positive relationship between a municipality being considered urban and their willingness to contract out services, we found that there is not a statistically significant and or relationship at all between whether or not partisan identity of a municipality or risk of a budget shortfall impacts the choice. Thus, uh, we see that the literature at the urban rural spectrum actually contradicts claims that privatization choices are made for budgetary choices and or political reasons, which displays that there's both a lack of uniformity in conversations about privatization and that existing literature does not currently take into account the nuances of the urban rural spectrum and their decision making process. After this, I wanted to understand what services were likely to be contracted out and or to see how this impacts the way that we think about um, oversight of these services. And I think that this cuts two ways. The first is that we found significantly that services that were unlikely to be privatized were the same across the entirety of the spectrum, be it things like utilities, emergency services, public spaces like parks and recreation and or revenue uh, collection such as tax collection um, and things to that extent. But for services that are likely to prioritize, those significantly varied across the urban rural spectrum, which um, brings us to understand kind of what services are in high demand in certain areas. And or like I said, it's important context to understand how that impacts the type of um, credibility necessary. Finally, uh, we see that across the spectrum, jurisdictions feel okay with the choices that they have made to privatize certain services. We see in the dark blue uh, areas that uh, jurisdictions think they have too much privatization as opposed to the light blue, where it's jurisdictions who think they have the right amount, as opposed to the tan color who feel like they have not enough services. And while we see at completely urban and mostly urban areas that there are still municipalities who think they have not contracted out enough services as of the 2014 MPPS. We still see that numerous municipalities think that they have reached the right amount of privatization in their areas. Um, and that also begs the question, like, why do we care about how municipalities feel about their privatization? Uh, I think that this comes back to similar to what everyone else says, that we know that these questions of privatization are both a question of accountability, but also we see that municipalities on the urban side of the spectrum indicate that they don't feel like there's enough privatization, which leaves open a continual important hole in the data that requires further research to understand how privatization continues to impact accountability, local government priorities, and the funding of democracy within municipalities across the urban and rural spectrum. So to recap, we see that there is no difference in the privatization of whether or not a local municipal service is likely to prioritize over the urban rural spectrum. However, the services that are privatized may vary and or the willingness and the comfortability um, also of privatizing will does not change over the spectrum. However, there's a non-significant relationship where in urban areas who may desire to privatize more services than already exist. Thanks.
Amazing job, folks. Um, and I, if you haven't seen them, there are a number of chats coming in giving complimentary, uh, uh, you know, notes about your presentations. Um, thank you all. And if you uh, panelists all want to turn on your videos, I there I have a couple of questions that are specific to some of you that we'll try to do rapid fire, and then there's some that I think are something that can go that anybody can answer. So. Um, Carly, the first one is for you. Um, if you can talk us just briefly through how effectiveness was defined for survey respondents, and and you mentioned something about links between uh, what the tool was and how effective it was seen, but if you can talk us through some examples of that. And then finally, because you were in this survey more recently than I was, um, whether officials um, linked that participation to affecting policy change, like to actually policy decisions. I can't remember if that was asked or not. So yeah, answer absolutely. any bits and pieces of that. <laughs> cool, I'm gonna start with that last one just because it's quick and easy. Um, unfortunately, no, there weren't any questions on measuring um, follow-up, although there were similar questions um, in some ways asked in 2016, but no, it's uh, it can go on the wish list along with uh, updated internet access um, for next time. So, uh, to your other two points, Amy, uh, thanks for your questions. Uh, so effectiveness was asked um, subjectively. Uh, basically, they were asked to rate effectiveness on a one, two, um, six scale. So extremely effective, uh, somewhat effective, neither effective nor ineffective, all the way on down to don't know. Um, so I had that coded for effectiveness um, where I had removed the don't know, which is about 5% of each um, response. Um, just to kind of clear up the visualization a little bit. Um, and there was a little bit of a relationship between type of participation and effectiveness, but I actually didn't check to see um, significance. So in all, um, the sort of average effectiveness rating was better for um, meetings and for actions than it was for information sharing. Um, but it, it was, I think the difference was between 3.75 of an average rating and uh, 4.2 or so. Um, so potentially some, some interaction there. Um, oh, uh, nope, I think, I think is that all the pieces? I think so, thanks. And, and um, just a note, this is true for all of these papers. These are works in progress. Um, I encourage you to reach out to me or to the students themselves as they are finalizing these because your questions help them, you know, determine what additional bits of detail they include in those papers. So do feel free, like uh, your, your comments are fantastic. Um, Julie, a couple of these are, I think, more comments for you um, rather than questions. And one was, why did you use the 2012 data? Um, and we already addressed this, that like new data would be great. And what do you think you would find differently? You can add on to that if you want. Um, and also to note that this summer, there was some MPPS research that found that 10% of jurisdictions, um, mostly those with fewer than 5,000 residents, so small places, mostly rural, but it could also be kind of some, um, I'm imagining some more urban-esque villages um, that struggled with internet access issues when it came to running virtual meetings. So do you have any comments to add on to kind of those? Oh, all of the above. Um, I think it's really interesting and I'm sure that's been something we're seeing in a lot of rural areas as they try to very quickly pivot to online offerings, um, both like through official government channels and also just making sure that everyone has access that they need to work or go to school. Um, as far as why I use the 2012, that, um, that survey really went into depth on technology and asked all the questions about websites and concerns about setting up technology. Um, there was a question in 2019 about concerns related to census access, um, but I didn't find it um, directly useful for this because I think a lot of people are used to filling out the census in the mail and that might not be a concern for them to have internet access that way. Um, and I would definitely love more information. More recent information would be grand. <laughs> Christian, the quick question for you um, from Julia is on the question of what's the role of citizen engagement? Were respondents able to select one 
option or more than one. Um, and she notes that to keep citizens informed and to provide input were the most highly rated, but they're really complementary. And so it, it could be both and. Um, you didn't set, I will say, you didn't set up the survey questions, right? You, uh, you were working with data and questions that were already drafted. Based on what you found, do you think, would you write the question differently if this is asked again? Um, it, that's a great question, actually. Um, and from what I remember, um, I'll have to, I'll have to double, go back and double check. Um, I'm pretty sure it was, um, the question was actually more correctly phrased as like, which one do you think, like, what do you think is the primary role? Um, that being said, I wasn't, I'm not particularly sure if they're able to choose more than one or not. That's a, <laughs> that's more of a actual survey question, um, like response, but, um, you know, actually, in a way, though, I think that's actually a great point um, that for, for this particular part, um, you know, they were may maybe only able to choose the primary one. But um, I think being able to choose perhaps either like a ranked choice or um, or a multiple choice option might actually be better and yield some sort of additional nuances. Great. Christina, um, is there any consistency in which services are privatized in urban areas and not rural ones? And um, do you happen to know which are privatized in in those in urban places and not necessarily rural, rural places? So there is a difference, yes. A consistent difference, no. So we see uh, services such as like waste recycling and or things like engineering services and land use planning being more likely to be contracted out in urban areas as opposed to like certain uh, like common municipal priorities such as like street lighting and or snow plowing, which are more likely to be contracted in areas that fit the rural side of the spectrum. I could guess that maybe this occurs with things such as like land use planning and engineering. There's a higher availability of contracts and or a better quality of contractors in urban areas who are more likely to have the education to support. Um, but outside of that, there is nothing, at least that is captured in the MPPS that explains otherwise uh, why these differences exist across the spectrum. Excellent. Kyron, the questions didn't start coming until after your presentation. So I'm going to I'm going to give you the ones that were to all panelists and you get to choose first which question, which of those you want to answer. And then if they, if we still have time in the like four minutes that we have left, others can can post in. So. One question is about um, whether anything surprised you uh, in terms of what you're seeing. We, we're often seen as urban and rural divide. We've, we've said that this is urban and rural continuum. So is there anything that you found that, that fit that or, or kind of con was contrary to the kind of overall narrative in this space? Um, where do marches and demonstrations kind of fall into this? Like what opportunity, what um, do you think that this is going to change the discourse um, and lead to more common ground based on what you found on civic engagement? Um, did anyone do any breakouts? And I can't remember on race or ethnicity or income. And did you find anything interesting there? And then finally, one that you could choose to answer or not is, um, how you think a public, a, a public opinion might compare to what you found, all of you looked at just local official opinion. Um, my guess is that that one, you might have something in particular uh, to say on that one, Kyron. But you can answer any of them. Yeah, um, so if you, from what I remember, um, as far as what surprised me, and this kind of touches on the question about marches that I think uh, Chuck posed. So what I was expecting when looking at the 2018 um, civic discourse was that generally I expected that rural uh, settings would have more of a positive um, perception as far as elected officials on how civic discourse was, but I, was, I wasn't expecting urban that be the same way. Um, Typically, I would think, you know, there's more po people, more politics involved in urban jurisdictions. Um, so I, I was thinking going in that we would see that difference where um, the urban settings would be a little less um, positive civil discourse in the urban the other way. Um, what was interesting, though, as I mentioned in my presentation, when we looked at the five-year questions, uh, 
still the the plur, plur, plurality response um, was that there was neither um, more or less um, civic discourse as far as tone positive. Um, but the second response did kind of go towards what I originally thought, which was that rural settings felt more positive about their civic discourse and uh, urban settings didn't. And looking at that question, talking about a five year comparison, you know, we think about between 2013 and 2018, what happened, you know, you saw more protests um, about police violence. You saw, you know, the election of another president. Uh, so I think thing of now also, you know, that, and especially with everything that happens that has happened in 2020 with protests and with elections, I'm interested to see how that would change for another five years or in this year in particularly. Um, don't remember the other great. questions, but yeah. No, you did it. You did a great job. And I'm actually going to have to wrap it up because we're going to turn into a pumpkin and the webinar is going to end here. Um, I want to, uh, Bonnie, if you have the closing slide that we can pull up, just um, which I assume might have the uh, um, URL on it, just to thank again both the panelists and all of the folks who uh, listened. As I mentioned, please do, uh, if you've got some feedback, reach out to us. Um, uh, and if you are inspired by looking at other questions across the urban rural continuum, do contact us and let us know. Um, like I said, the recording will be online and we're still working on finalizing the papers. So uh, thank you so much for joining today. Have a great day.